Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, um, are there any kids in the house? Anyone younger than, let's say, 14? If you could raise your hand. Okay, if y'all could just leave, inshallah. Why are you laughing? I'm not, I'm not, what's, what's going on here? That's not cool? You can't, get, okay. So, khalas, there's a couple of things, inshallah, ta'ala, um, I wanted to discuss that I might not discuss, inshallah. Just use code but, words. Code words? Okay, so maybe, maybe we'll use some code words. I might need uh, Sheikh Omar's help with that, and coming up with the code words, inshallah. Okay, uh, misconceptions about love. Um, alhamdulillah, I've, I've been in a position for the last uh, almost two years where I get a chance to speak to a lot of people, and I've been put in a position where I very often i am put in front of young people. So one of the outcomes of that is that young people come to me for advice. And the other thing that I've seen is that a lot of young couples come to me for advice. So obviously older couples, they look at me, they're like this young guy wearing this ridiculous leather jacket. We're not gonna go to him for advice. But the younger crowd uh, does come to me for advice. And so for me, these last two years, they've been a learning experience in terms of the types of problems that a lot of the young couples, especially, and not, I'm not, not saying that the older generation, don't, they don't face these problems, but I'm saying I found it prevalent in the younger generation. And a lot of these problems, what I've, what I've noticed in these last two years is that a lot of these problems stem from misconce misconceptions that young people, and I hate to generalize, but I have to here a little bit, misconceptions that young people tend to have about love and relationships and all of that. So I, I compiled a list, uh, inshallah ta'ala, and I did this, it was the first time doing this, I compiled a short list of my top eight misconceptions, inshallah ta'ala, about love and relationships. Uh, number one, first misconception or first issue, uh, that infatuation equals love, or not being able to distinguish between infatuation and love. Infatuation is the initial feelings of lust and attraction and those butterflies in your stomach, which most people tend to confuse for love. They tend to think that that initial feeling when you look at someone and your eyes meet someone and you feel butterflies in your stomach and in your head there's like a Bollywood movie going off in the background <laughs> and you're in the field somewhere running through or something like that. That is what most people tend to think. They think that is love. And, weird, and yeah, it's kind of weird, it's a little bit weird. Uh, but that is actually infatuation. Those are the initial feelings that you have towards someone. Love, on the other hand, is something that takes time. So, as we know, when a couple, when they get married, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts love and mercy in their hearts, but that's the birth, that's the birth of the love. And as time goes on, the more you put into love, the love will grow and get stronger. Now, one of the issues I found with, with this uh, point is that sometimes young people, they will base their decisions regarding the person that they want to marry or the person they're, that they're in love with based off of their infatuation with them. So they may overlook serious issues of incompatibility, for example. So you have a brother and sister who want to get married, and on the face value, like if you were to talk to them, if you didn't know that they were in love or whatever, you would say you two are never compatible. And most likely, if they were to go speak to a sheikh or an imam or something like that, or they got some premarital counseling or something like that, the, they, it's very likely that the imam or someone would tell them, listen, you guys have a lot of issues that you need to work out before you actually enter into a relationship. Uh, so that's, 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 the first, that's the first thing. SubhanAllah, I remember once uh, a brother came up to me, a young brother, and uh, he told me, he said, sheikh, I'm in love with this girl, da-da-da, all this kind of stuff. And I said, okay, tell me about her. And I know this brother very well. So I was like, okay, tell me about her. And I was like, if you can, t if you can tell me about her, uh, I'll give you my advice on whether I think, inshallah ta'ala, the two of you will be compatible or not. And then he told me about her, and then I realized that she is very, very different than him. And he was actually a religious brother. She was completely not religious and all of that. And so I said, I, I told him, I said, listen, uh, what's the deal here? Like, I know this is not like you. If I were to ask you, normally, I would never imagine that you would marry someone like this in terms of like your religiosity or whatever you want to call it, you guys are on very different levels. And then he tells me, he says, you know, Sheikh, I just, I just felt like the first time I met her, you know, I just felt, it just felt right. And I felt like this is the one. This is my soulmate. Inshallah, we'll talk about soulmates, inshallah. But he said, this is the one. 
And I said, okay, let me just ask you one question. And I said, think about this question and then, and then tell me what you feel about the decision that you're about to make. I said, inshallah ta'ala, this girl or this woman, she will inshallah ta'ala one day be the mother of your children. She's going to be the person raising your children, giving your children the tarbiyah and, and upbringing and all of that. Are you comfortable with this person raising your children? And do you foresee any issues? And then he thought about it for a while and I told him, I said, you know, go home, think about it, come back to me. And then he came back to me and, and he told me, he said, he said I, I don't see it. He said, I never, I never thought that far ahead. And that's the problem in infatuation that people, we get so blinded by this quote unquote love that people don't tend to think beyond the attraction that they have initially. So that's misconception number one. I don't know how I'm gonna keep this under 10 minutes, but I'll try, yeah, inshallah. We're, we're, we're finish finish it. Okay, yeah. uh, number two. Seven minutes, seven, okay. <clears throat> uh, second misconception that people have about love and relationships is that if someone loves you, so someone, they, they'll tell themselves like, if this person really loves me, then they will change for me. So they'll tell themselves that, you know, even though, once again, we may not be compatible, we may have a lot of issues, a lot of differences, but we love each other. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll make it work. And I know, like, there's things I don't like about her, but I will change her, inshallah. And out of her love for me, she will change. Or she may be telling herself, out of his love for me, it will change. And as they say, love conquers all, right? Have you guys heard that? Love conquers all. So they say, you know what? We'll get through all of this because of our love. And subhanAllah, this is this, once again one of, one of the main issues that I've seen is that when people get over that infatuation stage, they realize that it's very, very hard to change someone else. And it's really that person who ha has to want to change themselves. And once you're no longer infatuated with the person and it's no longer, you're past that honeymoon stage or whatever they call it, five, six months, four months, two months, depending on who you ask, right? Once you're past that stage, it's very difficult. So I always tell young couples, I say, listen, this person, the way they are in front of you right now, the way you see them, marry them, keeping in mind or, or telling yourself that they're never gonna change. And if you're happy with them the way they are right now, then go ahead and get married. But don't make the assumption or don't assume that they're gonna change or don't tell yourself that yes, one day this person will change. <clears throat> Number three, third misconception. That by getting married, you are completing yourself. And as they say, you know, I'm looking for my other half when people trying to get married. Or people say, my better half, you know, sometimes. In the beginning of marriage, especially, people say, my better half, right? The issue here, the issue here is that when a person tells themselves and they say, I have issues right now, I don't feel whole, I have problems with myself, but once I get married, my spouse will complete me. And all the problems that I'm dealing with in life or my problems with my iman and whatever else I'm dealing with, my spouse will make up for that. Because she has these strengths that I want for myself and I may have some strengths and we'll complete each other. And Islamically, subhanAllah, we don't depend on our spouse to complete us. Our spouse can help, but once again, we can't count on that. Right? And it's also the issue of our relationship being whole with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or at least us striving to make our relationship whole with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and keeping that in mind before we get married. Right? So, and the most important thing, subhanAllah, is, is actually our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And if your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fine, then your relationship will be helped by that. Right? And so once again, the issue is depending on your spouse to complete you or help you complete your, your iman. And a lot of times what happens, one of the other issues I've seen here, is that sometimes we, when you, when you marry someone, with the intention that they will complete me or that they will make me better and all that, uh, we tend to leave, put our self-worth in their hands, right? We tend to tell ourselves that if my spouse, um, you know, they're the ones who are gonna make me feel better about myself and they're the ones who are gonna make me whole. And we forget that our self-worth is truly defined, at least according to Islam, our self-worth is defined by our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's an amazing, unbreakable thing. That when a person puts their self-worth in their piety or their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be secure in their relationship. Because they don't need, they don't have that need to have their spouse always tell them that you're amazing or you're perfect, which is all good, alhamdulillah. It's something that spouses should do. They should encourage one another and, and praise one another. But they don't rely on that single factor to make, them seal, make themselves feel whole or make themselves feel complete. Um, there's a story of Zahir radiallahu ta'ala which Sheikh Umar Sulaiman, I believe, uh, shares in his class. Is that correct? Yeah. And I share it in my class as well, so if you've taken our classes, you've probably heard it twice. Uh, the story of Zahir, it's basically, a, it's a very, very, very nice story. But one of the points of the story that I want to mention here is where the Prophet ﷺ, basically, he grabs Zahir radiallahu ta'ala, and the Prophet ﷺ loves Zahir very much. He's one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He grabs him from, from the back, and then at one point, and the Prophet ﷺ says, who will buy this slave from me? All right, it's like a joke the Prophet ﷺ is playing on Zahir radiallahu ta'ala to show his love and affection for him. And Zahir, once he realizes the Prophet ﷺ, he realizes the Prophet ﷺ is joking with him. He actually moves further into the embrace. He wants the Prophet ﷺ to hold on to him tighter. And at one point he says, he says, O Messenger of Allah, I think you will find that I am unsellable. That no one will really pay much for me. And they say about Zahir ﷺ that he wasn't like the best looking guy. Right? He wasn't that good looking or whatever. And he knew that. So he says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, listen, I... I think you will find that if you try to sell me, like no one's going to pay anything for me. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells him, he says, most certainly, O Zahir, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are extremely valuable. And what, Allah, what, the, what the Prophet ﷺ is teaching Zahir ta'ala here is that your value doesn't depend on your looks, on what people, how people see you and, and whether they think you're a valuable person or not. He tells him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells Zahir radiallahu ta'ala, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds you valuable. And here we see the Prophet teaching the companions about self-worth, where their self-worth lies. And it's very important that before people jump into a relationship or get into a relationship, they understand that. That in the end of the day, their spouse may be happy with them, they may be upset at them, they may be proud of them, they may be disappointed with you, like your spouse may be disappointed at you, but your self-worth is directly tied to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, misconception number four. four. There is one single person out there for each and every one of us. And this goes back to the issue of your soulmate. One of the things I talk about in my classes is this issue and how um, pop culture and Hollywood and romantic comedies and all that, one of the things that all this teaches us is that one of your goals in life is for you to find your soulmate that one person out there in the world somewhere who is perfect for you. And they're going to, once you meet them, everything is going to be perfect, everything is going to be amazing. Like I said, if you're in a Bollywood movie, there's gonna be like fireworks and stuff in the background, and you're gonna know this is the person. Right? This is the one person for me. SubhanAllah, I remember the first time I taught my class, uh, after I mentioned the issue of the soulmate, a sister came up to me and she said, Sheikh, are you telling me I don't have a soulmate? And I said, well, it depends. If by soulmate you mean that there's only one person out there who once you meet them, you're going to know there's going to be butterflies in your stomach and everything's going to be amazing and they're going to be perfect and they're never going to say anything to upset you and they're always going to know when to bring you flowers and your mind, you'll be on the same wavelength at all the time, right? Whatever you're thinking, this person knows. If that's what you think a soulmate is, then yes, I'm telling you, you don't have a soulmate. However, if you mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you to marry a certain individual, and you want to call that person your soulmate, alhamdulillah, no problem, go ahead and call that person your soulmate. Right? So now, the issue here is when we tell ourselves <clears throat> that there's only one person, and that person will be perfect, and there's going to be no issues and all of that, and I've had this happen to me as well. A sister came up to me, and she said, I'm, you know, I'm having some issues with... Uh, my husband, and we're having problems, and she said it wasn't like that in the beginning, but now, you know, we're having all these issues, and then she says to me something which subhanAllah very, uh, hurt me very much, and it was actually the first time I'd heard this, now I've heard it many times, but it was the first time I heard this, and what the sister said to me, she said, I think I married the wrong person, 
And I said, why? And she said, because I don't think he's my soulmate. Right? And it's kind of like now the issues that they were having were not like major issues, like that are grounds for divorce or anything like that. Right? These were issues where she's like, yeah, I just don't feel that connection anymore. Right? Like, it's just not there. Like, my heart is it's just not there. And, you know, we don't, he doesn't know what I'm thinking. Right? Like, it just doesn't. So I think I married the wrong person. I need to go find my soulmate. Right? That's misconception number four. Number five, once you find your soulmate, they will be perfect. They will be absolutely perfect. There's going to be no issues with your soulmate. Now, seeking perfection is, wallahi, a big problem. And I've narrowed it down to two big issues with seeking perfection or looking for that perfect person, that soulmate or whatever. Number one is that that person doesn't exist, as we said. There's no one who is perfect. So a brother or sister may spend their whole life trying to find that perfect person. And wallahi, you, think, you may think I'm exaggerating, but I, once again, I've seen this happen. That what's stopping a certain brother from getting married? This dude's like 35, getting on to 40, right? He's got a job, he can provide for his family, all that kind of stuff, but he's not married yet. Why? His mom brings him a new girl every weekend, right? Check her out. What do you think about her? He's like, yeah, I don't know. There's a couple issues here and there. Uh, let's see what else you got, right? And this has started when the guy was like 25. Ten years later, he's still, look, he's still going through sisters, right? Every day, someone else is like, yeah, I don't know if this person's perfect. You're never going to find that person. There's no single person out there who is perfect. And something I believe I mentioned in my earlier talk as well, no matter how big of a scholar someone is, no matter how big of an imam they are, no matter how popular they think they are, there is no individual on the face of earth, on the face of the earth today who is perfect, who doesn't make mistakes, who doesn't have certain shortcomings, who doesn't have certain issues. Right? So you're not going to find that person. Number two, the other problem with looking for perfection is that if you marry someone on the assumption that they are perfect, that they are your soulmate, then you're going to be let down very quickly. Right? In a short period of time, you're going to find out that they have issues and they have mistakes. And I get it. I get it. We live in a, in, in a culture where we're told, like you watch TV and you watch movies and things like that. You watch The Notebook, for example, and you're like, oh my god, Ryan Gosling is like perfect in this movie. Right? Like, I want that. I want that. Like, so a sister may be watching The Notebook, and she tells herself, she says, that is the type of guy that I want my, for myself. Right? I want, I want my Ryan Gosling, except, and this is one of the things I often say, I want my Ryan Gosling, except I want him wearing a thobe, and I want him with a beard. <laughs> right? That's the difference. That's the difference between that Ryan Gosling and, and my Ryan Gosling. This person doesn't exist, and you're going to have issues if you marry someone with the assumption that they are perfect. Even, like I said, I, I get it. We live in a culture. Even subhanAllah, and this is an issue which I was debating whether to bring up here or not, but I, I think this is an issue which is common now. Even in the Islamic circles, even in like the, da the way da'wah is, is, is uh, the da'wah scene is right now, uh, a lot of young people look up to speakers and, and scholars and, and, and people who are well known, and they just assume that this person, because they're on stage, because they're giving a talk, because they have knowledge and that, that they are perfect, that they have no issues. And that is, now. Don't blow our cover. <laughs> you said don't blow our cover. I'm about to. <laughs> Blow your cover, cover really hard right now, Sheikh Amla. I'll, sh I'll share a story with you, okay? <clears throat> this is a story that happened with a close friend of mine. I actually shared the story in my class as well. So if you've taken my class, you've heard the story before. Uh, a close friend of mine who's a well-known speaker, and I'm not going to say his name, but if I said his name, I would imagine that almost everyone in this room would know who this person is. This, uh, this brother, may Allah protect him, he was uh, the imam of a community for a long time. So he'd get a lot of phone calls. People would call him with issues and this and that. So one day he gets a phone call, and it's his sister. And it wasn't odd because, you know, like I said, he's the imam. People call him with their problems and all that. So he gets a call, and he picks up the phone, and it's his sister. She says, assalamu alaikum. He says, wa alaikum assalam. And she goes, Sheikh, I'm in love with you. <laughs> and... This brother, mashallah, one thing I say about him is this guy's a boss, right? He's, he's a boss. So you know what he says to her? He goes, sister, you're not in love with me. You're in love with your perception of me. You're in love with who you think I am. 
He says, if you only could talk to my wife, she would tell you. <laughs> I'm not telling the story yet. <laughs> he said, if you could only speak to my wife, she would tell you how I make her cry every single day. Right? And he slammed the phone. Right? So we assume that because people may be good looking or whatever, like Sheikh Omar said, Iman, obviously, right? <laughs> and they're a public speaker. <laughs> Anyway, the point is, perfection doesn't exist, right? Even in people who look amazing, and they may be very amazing people, like I know Sheikh Omar said, Iman. All, all, all jokes aside, all jokes, all jokes aside, I love him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> okay, moving on. What, what point was that? Number five, four, six? Six, six. I, I promise I'm almost done. I know I'm like five minutes over my time. Do you guys allow me to continue? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> Number six. Number six. The sixth misconception people have about love is that love is effortless. Or love is supposed to be effortless. That if you love someone and they love you, and you know if they're your soulmate and all, that love is not going to require any work that you don't have to put anything into your relationship. You either love the person or you don't. And the reality of the matter is that love, the truth is that love always requires work. And that's, that's love in your relationship, not only with your spouse, it's with anyone who you love, right? Even your parents, who you have that natural inborn love, you can increase that love, you can strengthen that love by being obedient to your parents, for example. Right, doing things for your parents, being kind and generous to your parents, or you can decrease that love by being disrespectful to your parents and things like that. And even, subhanAllah, walillahi mathalun a'la, and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the highest example, even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can increase our love for Allah if we are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more obedient we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more of our life we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we strengthen our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the more we disregard the obligations and all of that, the, what we will find is that even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our love for Allah will weaken. Right? Love requires work. And this is something a lot of young people, they just don't get this. Right? It's the whole concept of either you love some person or you, don't, or you don't love some person, and they don't realize that love indeed requires a lot of work. Number seven, that true love, that seventh misconception, that true love is unconditional. That if someone truly loves you, and you love them, or let's say, and I'm actually, once again, I another case study, uh, someone came to me, I was talking to this couple, um, they're having issues with one another. And one of, one of the things that I came to realize is that they had very unrealistic expectations from each other. And then one of the problems was that the, the sister, when talking to her, I realized that she, her concept of love is very skewed because she believes that her husband has to love her no matter what, right? Whether she's a good wife or not, whether, what she does or not, it doesn't matter. This is your soulmate. The love it will always be there. Right? It does not depend on what you do for your spouse. Or and same thing, like, same thing happens on the guy's side as well. And especially, I would say especially on the guy's side, where a guy says, you're my wife, you have to love me no matter what. Right? Or, or especially like if you believe you married your soulmate, that because you're my soulmate, this love will be there. It doesn't matter how we treat each other or what we do that love cannot be broken. And once again, when people begin to see that their love is, doesn't have that same factor and that their spouse doesn't love them unconditionally, they may resort to saying something like, maybe you're not the right person for me. Maybe you're not my soulmate or something like that. Lastly, last issue is that you're always ready for love as long as it's the right person. I'll say it again. You're always ready for love 
as long as it's the right person. So basically, it doesn't matter where you are in your life, doesn't matter uh, how much you've done or what you're capable of and all of that, none of that matters. When you find the right person, when you find your soulmate, for example, then that is the right time to be in love and that is the right time to be in a relationship. You're always ready, as long as it's the right person. And the truth of the matter is, this is one of, and this is, I know I put this at the end, but this is one of the biggest issues that I've seen. You know, about, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, before I went to Medina, when, when I remember back in the day when I first started practicing Islam, when there was a revival in the da'wah, there was a lot of speakers coming on the scene and people calling to Islam and all of that, one of the things that a lot of speakers would say, they would always encourage the youth to get married young. Right? The scholars and, and the speakers in, in, in America, they would tell young people, like, listen, you're young, there's so much fitna in this society, there's so many issues, so many problems, so many temptations, so one of the things you can do to protect yourself is to get married young. And subhanAllah, because of that whole era, we're actually seeing the, the, well, some of the problems of that era today. And one of the problems is that people jumped into relationships back then unprepared. Right? They were like, okay, the only thing that matters is that I find someone and I get married. So people would get married and they don't understand some basic things that a person should know before they enter into a relationship. For example, just the simple fact or understanding that men and women are different. There are times when women react differently to situations and men react differently. There's nothing you can do to change the person. There's gonna be the times when your spouse reacts in a certain way and you just cannot understand it. You have no choice but to accept it. You can bang your head on the wall, you can go crazy, you can pull your hair out, you can do whatever you want, but this is how she understands the situation. Right? And so you, have, you just have to accept that at certain times. Like the understanding that there are certain differences between men and women. Uh, one of the things the scholars of the past, they would say, subhanAllah, is that and I think this needs to be revived today as well. They would say that it is impermissible for a person to get married until they understand the rulings of marriage and divorce. The fiqh of marriage and divorce. At least the basic fiqh of marriage and divorce. And subhanAllah, how many people today get married and they don't have a clue? A single issue happens and it's like, I don't know what to do, call the imam, start freaking out because they have no idea. And a bigger issue than that is not understanding the rights and responsibilities that you have as, as, a, as a spouse. And SubhanAllah, uh, one of the misconceptions brothers have is uh, that my only responsibility, for example, is I have to provide her with food, shelter, and clothing, right? And especially like, it's something I saw from religious brothers who like, you know, maybe are not providing well for their family. And when questions say, listen, what's the deal? Like, why aren't you providing for your family? And she has certain needs and wants and all that kind of stuff. Why can't you provide that? And he says, listen, it's shar shara'an, according to the sharia, ah, the only thing the sharia ah asks of me that I'm required to do is provide her with f uh, um, food, shelter, and clothing. And subhanAllah, that is a very limited understanding of what the sharia ah requ requires. Right? So not having the knowledge of what a relationship takes. And this is why one of the things that I always tell anyone who comes to me for advice regarding getting married, I say always, always, always get premarital counsel. Right? Always, for me, like if someone wants me to do a nikah or something, I'll be like, listen, I'm not touching your nikah with a 10-foot pole unless you can prove to me that you've gotten some premarital counseling done, that you can show to me that you know what it means to be married. You can, uh, you've had to at least think about some of the situations that will come up when you get married, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That's my top eight list, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, our uh, mashayikh and the brothers can add to what I've said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <coughs>